MD Poly World, and welcome back to another week, another episode. Uh, we took last week off uh, just for some summer summer breaks, and we are back, and we are excited to have one of our long-awaited guests that you have heard us refer to on many occasions, uh, Donald Savoie, who is uh, the author of a book, um, uh, Looking for Bootstraps, that talks about economic realities in the Maritimes. We're going to get to that, but before we get to that, I um, just want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, the Wolostook, and the Paskatomakati here in Menaquist and St. John. And um, this week, we're going to be having a, a real just like candid conversation between Donald and myself. Couldn't uh, Joanna couldn't be here. Uh, just work schedules wouldn't allow for us to kind of all coordinate. So I'm just going to have a, a long con format conversation with Donald, and we're going to bring him in right now. Welcome to the show, Donald. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, uh, just as we were preambling before we started to record, uh, we've we've mentioned your book more than a number of times. We've wrestled with some of the economic sort of realities and advice from economists, and uh, especially as St. Johners here, with you know the largest industrial presence west of Mont or east of Montreal, and and uh, oftentimes not necessarily seeing the benefits of it. Uh, and certainly on council, we've opine more than a number of times of the the way that that industrial taxation works and tax assessment works um but but you you have a long history of sort of engagement in economic development and i'd love it if you could just give us a, a you know a highlight of your life and your work um between the federal government and and local initiatives as well as now uh, with what you're doing today well i i've had an interest in uh, in economic development my whole career. I have a strong interest in the maritime provinces. I'm a maritimer by birth, by choice. Um, and I think one of the highlights, apart from my publication, was Brian Mulroney in 1986, asked me if I would consult with Atlantic Canadians, the business community, his ministers, premiers, and produce a report on what was needed uh, for Atlantic Canada. And I did. And the report led to the establishment of the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. It's the longest serving uh, structure in, in regional development. And then it was, it was adopted in other regions. We now have seven, one in Quebec, two in Ontario, one in Western Canada, one in British Columbia, and one in, uh, in Northern Canada. And so that, uh, and, uh, uh, and the agency has been there for, well, since 87. It was announced in June 87. So it's had a long track record, and I, I've been associated with it. And, and my publications, most of them, not all, but most of them deal with Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we certainly have uh, been on the receiving end of some criticism from folks like Pierre Elliott Trudeau when it comes to selling off the Maritimes and poor economic performance. So what got you started in economic development before, before Brian Mulrooney sort of tapped you for that? What was, uh, what was your starting point? Well, uh, being a, a real committed Maritimer, and I, I wanted to, I had this curiosity when I was at UNB and followed up after, um, uh, I, I was trying to understand why our region was not growing as fast or as well as the other regions. And I wanted to pinpoint the reasons. A lot of the, a lot of the literature blamed us. Uh, and I, I challenged that. Um, I don't think it's us. I think it was national policies. And I, it, you make reference to the book, sort of looking for bootstraps. I document how national policies favored Ontario and Quebec, both rich Ontario and Quebec, and how it played havoc with our region. And I, I, I say it's peculiar because we're the only federation in the world that doesn't have an upper house that speaks on behalf of the regions. Australia, US, Germany, even Russia has an upper house that speaks on behalf of the regions. We don't. So our national policies have really been geared to vote rich Ontario and Quebec, and we paid a heavy price. Um, that's what got me started. I just didn't buy into the argument that maritimers were lazy, not productive, and so on. Uh, demonstrably, it's, it's, it's false because maritimers are indeed hard workers. They're tough fishermen, farmers, and a lot of, a lot of maritimers moved to Ontario and Quebec and New England states where they, where they blossomed. And so 
I, I decided to challenge that, and that's that's how I got going. Interesting. So you went to UNB. Uh, I, I did my first degree uh, here at the University of Moncton, did okay. a graduate studies at UNB, and then went to Oxford. Okay. Wow. Okay. And at Oxford, you was I would I would assume it was economics that you studied. It was political economy. It's a special okay. program to have at Oxford, and uh, I spent three years there, and uh, I've been going back most years as a visiting scholar. I bet. Yeah. Wow. I mean, your book is you know sort of this you know, deeply introspective work around economic development, and I know it's really informed a lot of. Um, a lot of my thinking, as well as uh, a lot of my approach when it comes to political engagement here at the at the lower level in which I am, but I certainly interact a lot with um, different parties here in the province and and nationally at at certain levels. And you know, one of the things that occurs to me is you know, ever since I was a kid studying Canadian history and Canadian politics, there has been this sense that Confederation really you know cut us off at the knees when it came to our economic potential and prosperity. Um, and, you know, it's been something I've been learning about that you go on at longer length and more detailed uh, length, kind of outlining how some of these policies have really hampered our ability to engage. Because I agree. I mean, I come from Black Harbor. My family were all fishermen. Um, you know, I, I swore I wasn't going to work at the fish factory. So I started swinging a hammer and I've got, you know, I've got two degrees and I was a general contractor for well, I still am some days. <laughs> Next week, I'll be on a, I'll be on a roof pulling off a roof. So um, it's like we we tend to have a, a pretty gritty nature in the Maritimes. You're right, but it hasn't necessarily leaned into a lot of growth. And you know, certainly here in St. John, we've we've wondered at that ourselves. So you know, I, and I so I get that argument that Confederation you know turned us from that north south focus to an east west which wasn't natural to our current what, what our history or our reality or any of that um which you know killed us and and these different policies which played into that continued to to dampen us but what do you think what do you think is a, an issue right now that is still in place that hasn't shifted that is still causing that s suppression or i guess do you see one that's a better question no actually uh, I, i've been doing a lot of thinking lately and the book looking for bootstraps circumstances are very uh, are quite different today i just look at moncton and halifax they're really booming we have a we have a problem uh, because the overpopulation of moncton has caused a housing crisis uh, mm -hmm. i mean a house goes up for sale 24 hours later it's sold even today mm -hmm. prices have skyrocketed it's blocked out a lot of people from owning a home um, Halifax is pretty well the same, though I gather Moncton is booming even more than Halifax, which is quite, you know, it's quite the story. So the point I, I, I'm making is that Moncton, Halifax look a lot like Waterloo, Kitchener, Brandon, and Sask or Moose Jaw. We, our urban centers are booming. Mm -hmm. And and so you say, what has transpired? Well, there's a lot of new Canadians coming uh, to Moncton, St. John, Halifax, and so on. And that, that poses a different problem because we now see our public services uh, straining. As you would know, you're a city councillor. Yep. The demand on public service in urban centres is incredible. Our hospitals can't keep up. We have temporary classrooms in most schoolyards. And so we're seeing, we're seeing a booming economy. And then you say, why? I think there's a couple of reasons. And the number one, and we don't seem to focus on it, nearly as much as we should i think free trade agreements have opened up businesses for maritimers we a lot of businesses now and you go to you know you go you go to moncton airport you see flights leaving with products every day mm -hmm. that was not the case 20 30 years ago so free trade agreements has really kicked in it takes a while but it's opened up markets in a way before free trade agreements, uh, as Casey Irving once said, uh, big businesses from Ontario and Quebec, all they have to do is nudge products uh, downhill. We have to haul our products uphill. Yep. And, and because of free trade agreement, we don't have to haul our products uphill. We can sell our products in New England, in China, in Europe, and we're doing that. Um, so I think we need, we need to focus on that a lot more. Second, 
we have more of a culture of new businesses in the Maritimes than we had 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Perhaps there's a free trade agreement, perhaps any, you know, for any number of reasons. I recall 30, 40 years ago, students at my university, when they left university, the ticket to a good life was getting a job with the federal government or yep. the provincial government. That's less the case today. I see the best and brightest wanting to start a business. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing entrepreneurs here in Moncton just growing business by leaps and bounds. And so there's a cultural shift. And I think maritimers are seeing that the, f the field is now much more open you know, for them to grow a business, to start a business than was the case 30, 40 years ago. So the problem we have in, here in the maritime provinces is less of an urban problem because their you know, cities are booming. We have a rural problem. Yep. And bear in mind that uh, the maritime provinces as a region was much more rural than other uh, than Ontario, Quebec, or Western Especially Canada. New Brunswick, yeah. New Brunswick and Nova Scotia as well. And so rural Canada has economic, cha economic challenges of the kind that we had 30, 40 years ago. And so that's where we are. There are parts of the maritime, parts of the maritime provinces that are booming, absolutely booming. Other parts of the maritime provinces are having uh, slow growth. Mm. You know, I, 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 I read a lot of, uh, I don't know if you've ever read any, actually, I, one question I did want to ask you is who do you read? Like when you're looking to sit down and engage with sort of a thoughtful um, piece or book or author, who would that be? Well, when it comes to economic development and the history of the maritime provinces, Ernie Forbes, who was okay. at UND, uh, professor, who was professor of history, he was one of the best. And if anybody inspired me to pursue that area, it was Ernie Forbes. I had the good fortune to meet him a couple of times, a delightful person, a strong scholar, who did influence my work and the work of a lot of maritime scholars. Uh, so if you want to look at the history of maritime provinces from an economic you know, perspective, start with Ernie Forbes. Okay. Yeah, I uh, just type in him in there now. I, uh, I, hadn't, uh, I hadn't run across him yet, but... Um, you know, one person I read a lot about is George Monbiot. Uh, he's an author that writes in The Guardian in the UK. He writes uh, a fair bit about sort of the end of, he has a, he has a book called um, Politics in an Age of Crisis. Um, or sorry, what, what is it called? I, I think I'm getting the subtitle there, right? But anyway, so George, you know, he's written a, a fair bit about this era of crisis. And he talks a lot about the fall of neoliberalism. When I hear people talk about NAFTA, and I and the free trade agreements. One of the one of the pieces of, of to the puzzle that I see differently that we're we're starting to tack into nationally. And I guess the question is, do you think neoliberalism as an experiment? Um, and I mean, just to kind of define what I mean by that, I mean this you know this idea that we need to make sure we're producing goods for the cheapest amount possible, um, with the you know cheapest energy possible, with the cheapest logistics possible. To deliver to market and if that means you know taking um taking manufacturing and moving it overseas so be it um that seems to have shifted because of the the crisis that we find ourselves in globally geopolitically with different actors who are now making it incredibly difficult and we're seeing that the limitations of some of those international supply chains have major impact on our local resiliency and sustainability you know, we're seeing some of that industrial policy change nationally. Certain we're seeing it in the States with, you know, Buy American um, initiative, as well as uh, the inflationary, the Inflation Act um, and Biden's Green New Deal. Do you think that this is a, a, like a place for New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to, or do you think we're well suited to be able to make that shift? Uh, you know, often people will joke about the Maritimes being 10 years behind, right? You know, and I lived in Toronto, that was certainly a, a sense that I had that we were still 10 years behind everyone else, which gives us an advantage, right? Because we don't, we don't make some of the mistakes <laughs> that we see other places make. But I guess I'm not sure on, on this front, whether our government policies and our economic development agencies are trying to tack with those times and, and pursue those initiatives to repatriate our supply chains um, anyway, there's a lot there. I'd love your comment on that because it's it's been something I've been trying to figure out as to where we find ourselves in the Maritimes. You, you're asking a very fundamental question. 
uh, a terribly important question. And the answer to your question, I think, lies in the fact that government, govern, governments, plural, are not nearly as credible actors as they were 40 years ago. Mm. I think people are losing confidence uh, in their governments. Now, uh, why? Well, I think the point you've raised about free trade agreements, I think the average Canadian is saying, well, something went wrong here. The economic elites benefited greatly from, from globalization. We did not. And government was on the sidelines looking at things, but didn't move in to do something to help the average Canadian. So there's a level of frustration that we're seeing. We're seeing it in Europe. We're seeing it in France. We're see I just came back from England, uh, spent time there. We're seeing it uh, very much in England. Mm. We're seeing in the U.S. People can see what they like about Donald Trump. I understand that. Uh, the fact is that Trump is tapping into something that uh, is getting Americans to say, well, he has a point. Uh, a lot of things about Trump that I find just not acceptable from a but he is saying globalization that played has played a tricks on you know on the average uh, American worker. And so government as a credible actor is not what it was 30, 40 years ago. And so people are reacting and that's why I think you're seeing the kind of election results we saw in Great Britain, uh, what we saw in France, what we may well see again uh, in November. And you're seeing it here in Canada as well. There's a reaction and there's a, there's a tendency to look to the strong man uh, as, as a solution. So the point you're asking about liberalism, where, where it has gone and where it's going, I think where it has gone over the past 60 years has, has made an, an important contribution to the well-being of Canadians. Where it's going now, it's, it's much less certain because I think people are, t are taking a second look at the role of government saying, mm, it doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're into, you talked about a crisis. Um, yeah, I think it's, you're not overstating. You know, I think there is a crisis looming, uh, not just in Britain, not just in the US, but here, uh, you know, here as, well, as well. So the, the question is, what, what, how do we cope with this? And that's going to be the political debate in the next five, 10 years. Mm. You know, and it, it occurs to me like one of the fault lines that we see more so in my in the last four years, especially in the Maritimes, um, around this housing piece that you mentioned that Moncton is suffering with, you know, with quadrupling of the rate of homelessness and crime rate. You know, I, and I saw recently that Moncton has the second worst crime rate now in the country, um, which has come with those growth pressures. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, when we think economic, economically about the engine of Canada and the different, act, like actors that produce GDP. I mean, I was pretty shocked to learn that the number one GDP producer of in, in Canada is real estate and leasing. Um, and, and the question I always ask myself, and that happened in 2008 from as best I can find. Before that, it was manufacturing. And then somewhere around 2008, those two tipped and they've just gotten further and further apart. Um, and construction is number four, right, on the list. So the activity to create housing isn't, isn't top three. Um, so I, I guess I look at that and I think to myself, but basic economics is tells us and teaches us that when supply is strained and constrained, that prices and profitability goes up. How do we expect to keep that housing system in its current state? Because I know that the federal government is throwing a lot of money at it. And provincially, Susan Holt um, is putting some pieces on the on the floor as well. And David Kuhn is putting different ones. And, you know, Higgs just seems determined to sort of tack neither direction and you know i look at that and i and i see the fragility that it creates at the local community level which has to influence businesses and where they set up shop and how they how they choose to you know expand or not in in local areas and i and i just wonder to myself like is is there anybody that is looking at this from an economic feasibility lens 
um, or have you looked at that housing piece? And you know, what would your observations be? It's funny you would raise that because three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, I got a call from a journalist at the Globe and Mail in Toronto. Okay. And he started off by saying, how can you afford to live in Moncton with the price of housing? <laughs> and I said, to, I said, to, you're you calling from Toronto, Toronto? And you're, <laughs> you're telling me that? Where have you been? I said, no, no, no. If you look at the price increase over the past 12, 12 or 24 months, Moncton outshines every city yes. in Canada. And I said, well, still. But the question you're asking, how do we deal with a housing crisis? We have a crisis. We have a housing crisis that's quite serious, and it's it's a it's a perfect storm because we're we're accepting new Canadians by the bucketful. We're not adjusting our public services to accommodate the new you know population growth. We have a construction sector that's aging. We have a construction sector that, uh, if you look at workers, um, you know the retirement age is five ten years down the road. Yep. Uh, Somebody moving to Moncton from Halifax wanted to build a house, and he quickly found out it made no sense because building a house in Moncton now takes nine to ten months because subtrades are so busy you just can't cope. Correct. And if you're a single homeowner wanting to build a house, forget it because the subtrades are going after people that will rehire them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it is it is a serious crisis, and it's brought about by an aging sector brought about by, we didn't value construction workers as much as we should have, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and uh, thirdly, it's, it's, uh, it's not about to get better because uh, the construction workers are aging at a faster clip than other sectors. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect storm. How do we deal with that? You can throw money at it, but throwing money at it, uh, I'm not sure is the long-term solution. I think the long-term solution is to except that construction trades are terribly important to the, you know, to the New Brunswick economy and to the Canadian economy and to do something about that trade. Yeah. And I, I certainly per have a lot of personal experience there. And I, I see, you know, my, one of my own initiatives that I've tried to get off the ground here in the city is, um, is a training program called Hammers to Homes, which starts taking construction tasks and turning them into micro credentials so that we're not trying to produce, you know, the red seal carpenter who can do all things, um, and just focusing on that, but focusing on different parts of a job site uh, so that you can you can have competent people doing those tasks and you don't have to necessarily have them be good at everything um, to you know sort support that local workforce. And I've had some mixed results with that. you know since I've since I was a kid, we've lost shop classes in in most high schools. Yes, and I so I see what you know of course we see the lack of respect and you know, I'm like, I'm in a perfect example. I was told to go get a bachelor's degree and then went on to get my part of my master's degree. I never was able to finish my master's. Um, but now I swing a hammer most, most days. And when I look at the system though, overall, I, I see that we are the only country in the G7 that has real estate and leasing as its number one industry. And I can't help but think there are people, and you mentioned them before, um, I think you called them the economic elite um, that are making a lot of money off this crisis. And when I go like, I'm, you, you know, I see a lot of different pieces of the puzzle that are problematic here. We've got vacancies that can't be solved. We have, uh, and you know, in, in bigger cities, that's foreign investors who are sitting on empty buildings. Um, we, but we also have government that is refusing to push back against the private sector. Um, you know, and I look at that, and I'm like, do we really have the right model of housing if, if we're throwing money at it, even if we did, even if we were able to, you know, add a thousand new construction companies that are, were, were well resourced in, in Atlantic Canada, and we created the supply that we're behind on, even if we did that, the question that comes to me is who's going to own those units, who's going to own those apartments and who's making money on them. And do we have the right mixture around the, the civil, the civic society groups like nonprofit developers and cooperatives and, and government municipal housing and whatnot, like we did when we originally solved this, this crisis, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite at the government level to go back to what worked post-World War II. And I wonder why that, that, that is sometimes, and I wonder if that's something that you had any sort of interaction with. 
I do, and I appreciate the question. What you're asking is a fundamental one. You're asking why is government unwilling or unable to take on the big issues? Why is government unwilling or not able to take on the private sector in certain areas? That's the question that, that you're asking. Yeah. And the answer is that very few people now see government governments as, a credi as credible actors. I think something has gone wrong. And what has gone wrong is a growing lack of respect we have towards government. And why is that? I think we've made it life so difficult, so difficult for politicians and public servants to serve that, that um, we've crippled the ability of government to do things. Let me explain. Hmm. We, 40 years ago, there was no such thing as uh, access to information legislation. 40 years ago, there was no such thing as social media. 40 years ago, there was no such thing as an interpret comments towards politicians or public servants. Now we're fully loaded with that. We don't have, we don't leave, we don't give politicians the ability to serve like we used to. Um, and so why, why do we expect government to be a credible actor if we don't give them the tools to serve? I, 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 I recall reading C.D. Howe, who was the minister of everything in the 1950s. <laughs> every Friday afternoon, he had a summer home in St. Andrews, by the way. But mm. every Friday afternoon, he would sit down and look at his portfolio and look at government decisions and match his portfolio to what the government was about to decide. And he used to say, well, what's good for C.D. Howe is good for Canada. Today, no politician would even dream of doing that. <laughs> would even dream of doing that. We wouldn't allow a politician to look at his portfolio. But C.D. Howe did it. C.D. Howe served Canada extremely well. He built a modern economy, certainly in Ontario and Quebec. So we don't allow our governments to do what they were able to do. They once had the freedom to do. Uh, we just don't. And so then we ask, why is government not a credible actor? Well, I think we've done a good job at, at crippling them. Mm. And unless we give government its due place, no one's going to be able to answer your question. Why is government not willing to take on some of the tough issues? I see it's what you're saying. I, like I see what you're saying. Like the premise that we're now under as elected officials and bureaucrats, we're now under such a microscope and level of transparency is so high, but the level of competency that the, the average citizen brings to that conversation in the comment section on Facebook and to the conversation, you know, um, in in day-to-day -day life is really is really a lot lower. I think you're right. I think there used to be a lot more reverence toward elected officials and bureaucrats because people just knew that they didn't know enough about the issue to really make an informed decision or make it that much better. Although there, there was always, um, you know, populist groups and movements that would insist that they could do it better and that the government couldn't run a two car funeral. That's as old as, as anything. Right. But I, I see today, and there's a perfect example around housing here in this city. I call, I call my counts. I called my other my counsel um, a few weeks ago, uh, schizophrenic. And I didn't mean it disrespectfully. I wasn't trying to be, although I, I can be a very combustible person when it comes to those conversations. Um, but what I mean is, is like in, on the one hand, and I think this is kind of highlights what you're saying. On the one hand, we have this d deeply disturbed social fabric due to the rise of homelessness. Even in St. John, mm -hmm. it's triple what it was four years ago. Uh, drug use, break-ins, crime, um, fear, um, all of that. And then on the other hand, anytime I have a, a developer who comes and wants to put, uh, you know, a big box with enough units, you know, to make it scalable, I get every single person who's in that neighborhood with a house screaming about how we're ruining their neighborhood we're going to bring in, we're going to, you know, make traffic so bad that children are going to get run over and everybody's going to die. And this is the end of, you know, you couldn't, you know, you're, it's like you have that. And then 
it's like even me, I, I, I find myself trying to quarterback a, a transitional housing um, idea that we're trying to take advantage of vacant buildings that are that are here. And one of them is an arena and it's in this, you know, single detached family house neighborhood and it's decommissioned. It's an abandoned arena. And we've done a feasibility study. We realize you can put 40 units inside it, put wraparound services, do social enterprise development to to help people get connected to work um, and do, you know, um, uh, work with people who need that extra support around addictions and mental health uh, on site. And, and like that neighborhood, you know, not everybody, but many in that neighborhood are just about ready to crucify me upside down. Um, and so I see what you're saying. People are, they're able to get this information and they're afraid of the problem, the crisis we have, but nobody has sort of this, this desire to let somebody really go and pound away at the problem. Um, but I, but I think I see what you mean. It's a, uh, it's a difficult tightrope to walk on that front. We don't have the respect for our politicians that we once had. And we don't have the respect for our politicians that we should have. Um, and politicians now is only for the brave. If you want to be a politician, you better be brave. Because social media, there's no such thing as yesterday's news anymore. Mm. There was a time when the news was yesterday. Today, if you run for office and you did something wrong when you were 16 years old, it's going to come back. Mm -hmm. It's going to come back and bite you. So asking people to run for office to serve, to serve like they did 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it's asking a lot. It's asking somebody to put his life, his personal life, his family life on the line, open up to criticism, to nasty comments on social media, absolutely unacceptable comments. Mm. And so if, if we don't respect our politicians, how then do you think we'll, we'll ever be able to respect our government? And mm. if we don't respect our government, then government cannot do the kind of thing that you were just asking a while ago. Do you think, is there anywhere that you look to that you see hope on that front where you think there's a group or there's a leader or there's a party that is serious about that reality? Like I look at that and I, I can't think, but you know, those jargony political science terms like democratic deficit. Like we find ourselves in a pretty severe democratic deficit here between engagement and respect and outcomes and, and the whole piece. And, and I guess I struggle to, to find any, any groups or, or parties out there that are taking it seriously and putting something on the table that people are responding to. Sadly, uh, the answer to your question is no, I don't see it. I see an extremely polarized partisan political environment here in Canada, like elsewhere. Mm. And I don't know where it's heading. I wish that I could be a bit more optimistic than I am now. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's, it's a powerful brew that's taken shape. Uh, and we need political leaders of the kind that we may have had at one point, or they may have had the, the, the freedom to be political leaders. Um, and so at, at some point, something is going to give. Mm. And we haven't reached that point yet. Yeah, I, I mean, I say this to people oftentimes, you know, um, and we've on our podcast commented on the types of leaders that, uh, or the types of candidates that, that parties are trying to recruit. Um, and, and I think there's such an anti-elite sentiment now that exists in, in the public, yet we keep finding candidates that, remind us of those elites, you know, largely white. I mean, Susan Holt's a great example. We talked about it on the pod and, and I don't doubt that it's difficult for the reasons you listed to get candidates to step up and run, but you know, she may end up being the, the, the uh, province's first female premier with the, the fewest women uh, in her caucus for 40 years uh, of any party. Um, and uh, like, that, that, that's just one piece of the issue. And, you know, a, a large amount of the, of the people running are wealthier white men. And I think the public is, it, it has a difficult time developing that respect when, when we're so uh, disadvantaged economically at the, at the local level. Like I think 
to try to bring it first full circle to what you were talking about at the beginning the average canadian now believes they're doing worse every year than they were the year after that's been going for the last five years um like clockwork and it's not like the government hasn't tried to throw things at that problem but it isn't it isn't working like what role do you think the private sector has here in responding to this this looming crisis that you're describing well i've i know a lot of business leaders uh in fact you were asking about what i published i i published a book on harrison mccain one on casey and arthur irving and one on john mm -hmm. Brandt, the blueberry king and i did find in all three uh, a deep-seated desire to help their communities now they some people may view that as being a bit cynical i'm not harrison mccain was married to carlton county in a way that doesn't exist anymore mm. i remember he took me to his it sector and he said there's 400 jobs people wanted them in toronto i said no damn way they're going to be in florence um the irvings uh say what you like i happen to think they've made a major contribution but the irvings in st john that's where their head offices are it's mm -hmm. not in texas it's in st john and the head offices bring a lot of economic benefit and i was just reading you know a few hours ago about arthur and sandra irving giving i don't know 50 million to communities um john bragg is what i would call a model business person deeply deeply committed to rural maritime provinces deeply committed to his community uh not ostentatious at all very low profile just wants to do good for his community uh that's how i see them um i the, the next generation of business leaders that i see coming up that i see around moncton they're not cut from the same cloth they um they don't seem to be as committed to their community uh as the older generation was um and so when you're asking me about the role i see for the private sector there are some business people who are who are deeply committed maritimers to you know to their communities but it's not in everyone and if government cannot play the role that it once played at being the guardian of values uh if government can't play that role anymore because it's not as credible as it once was then surely the private sector has to step up some will some won't you know you're you're challenging a lot of my um world view here with that i and i'll say you know just to uh, humor me for a few minutes while i try to kind of cycle back through this because i think you're looking at things you know, you've had you've had a lot longer and you're a lot more well read than I am to be able to make the analysis you are. But at the at the very low level where I am at the community level here in St. John, there is a lot of animosity toward the, the wealthier here. Um, you know, I, I saw a post the other day, uh, somebody that said, you know, don't talk to me about your wealthy contribute your you know your big contributions through philanthropy until you actually start paying your taxes um and the city of st john has made its goal since probably about the mel norton years when mel was mayor um less so with mel a little more so certainly with don darling and it's continued into the current council i'm on of really pointing out the lack of contribution that major industrial sites like refineries like pulp and paper mills in the middle of urban places um, contribute compared to other jurisdictions right so you know you look at a smaller refinery in alberta and it's contributing four times as much to its municipality and here's the largest refinery in canada contributing less to the municipal tax base than than the regional hospital um, and you know those are hard to dispute and that has created a real sense and, and i wonder if you know, like you're pushing back at that. What I hear you saying is these people, you know, pushed against the tide to stay in the Maritimes, um, to resist those sort of neoliberal forces that would say, you know, centralize in the bigger space, go to where the work is happening, go to where the experts are, get out of this podunk, you know, little city here in New Brunswick and, and really make something of your company. Like I hear you saying, 
they made calculated decisions that were difficult and not necessarily monetarily su like uh, supportive of their companies to stay and, and stay supportive of their community. Yet, you know, you see some of those realities here locally and, you know, I can't help but, you know, wonder what's the fix here. Um, you know, certainly like you mentioned Arthur, you know, him threatening to, you know, offshore all of his accounts and go to Bermuda wasn't necessarily a, you know, a good community minded move in my opinion. Um, and I mean, and Jim Irving's gotten us in trouble with the, uh, with the world trade courts, at softwood lumber, uh, with his lobbying of the government there. So how do we square that? Like, help me square that because I absolutely have a cynical view. You know, I often say to people, New Brunswick has more billionaires per capita than any other part of this country. We have 4.4 billionaires for a country, for a province of 800,000 people. And there's only 42 billionaires in Canada, but yet we have the worst socioeconomic results to show for it and i i'm not saying there's a correlation but I, but i i look at those facts and i and i and i don't know what to make of them and i don't know how to look differently at the situation but i hear you saying there is a different way well let me answer that question it's in several components first of all i think st john should ask the question would they be better off if the refinery was in texas mm -hmm. Would it be would they be better off if the head office of Irving Oil would be in Boston? Um, on offshore tax deals, several things there. First, it wasn't Arthur Irving; it was Casey Irving. It was nineteen. Sorry, that's I, I should have said Casey. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. it was nineteen seventy two, and at the time, uh, it didn't come to pass. But at the time, the federal government wanted to impose a substantial tax on inheritance. Mm -hmm. So Casey Irving was faced with the prospects of that when he would pass away, half of the business would be taken to, taken out to pay taxes. So let's assume that when he passed away, his businesses were two billion. One billion of that would have gone to Ottawa. And Casey said, "I know what the federal government does with my money. I know what it's been like to grow a business here. So I'm not going to give Ottawa a billion dollars to hurt to turn it uh, and hurt us." in the long term. Thirdly, the offshore tax deal. That's something that I think I would hope that people would dig a bit deeper. It was not Irving Oil that started that. It was Standard Oil. Standard Oil took advantage of that tax break by moving uh, its op part of its operations offshore. And so Irving Oil looked at that, Casey looked at that and said, well, I have to compete with these guys. Remember, Standard Oil had a refinery in Halifax. Mm -hmm. competing against the refinery in St. John. So Casey Irving said, now, if they are going to do that and compete against me, I need to do the same thing to stay in business. Because if I'm not successful in business, it's no good to anyone. And so there's a lot of things that the Irvings have done, that John Bragg and the Harrison McGeans have done, that frankly, uh, if they weren't here, who would have done it? And we will, New Brunswickers will continue to buy gas. Mm -hmm. We can buy gas that's processed in St. John, New Brunswick, or we can buy gas that's processed in Texas. What would you prefer? Well, I look at the tax density on the refinery and it's less than the neighborhood that's adjacent to. So as a city councilor looking at just tax base, I, I don't know how to look at tax density in any other way based on the services that we provide that taxpayers pay into to make that refinery work. I'm not sure that it's a better payoff for the city of St. John sometimes. To your point, without a refinery here, without a mill here, what would you have? Um, but look up the street to Moncton. Moncton didn't have a refinery or it, and it didn't have a uh, pulp and paper mill. It didn't have any industry, yet it's made something of itself uh, you know, since the mid nineties and completely overtaken the city of St. John around population, around the service industry, you're working on your fourth industrial park, um, which is not heavy industry, it's logistics mostly. Um, so it is, it's a wrestling match I have, and I know, and I can, I can hear what you're saying. And I, and I hundred percent, I can't deny that, you know, without these, without the presence of these, what would you have? But I also can't look at that and say, we would be worse or better off, right? The crystal ball is difficult to look at when you see the growth of a Moncton in spite of not having those natural advantages. Well, 
but I have a very limited focus here. Right? No, no, because no, no, I'm, no, 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 no. I appreciate the comment, but bear in mind that Moncton, one of uh, one of the, if its most important economic player in Moncton is GDI. They moved uh, they moved some of their operations out of St. John, mm -hmm. um, and there are uh, businesses all over the city of Moncton that's GDI sponsored and GDI grown. Uh, so it's not just a St. John sort of phenomenon. In terms of tax breaks or taxes, well, you're on city council. If something is not right, do something about it. We can't. The province won't let us raise their taxes. We've uh, we got a handcuffs on on that front. If we have a multiplier, we're only allowed to add a 1.7 uh, multiplier to the tax rate of heavy industry. So if I lower the tax rate on on residents in the city, it lowers the tax rate on on industry. We don't have the uh, we don't have the tools to be able to do what you're saying. Well, your premier is from St. John. Don't we know it? <laughs> and, we, and we know who he worked for too. Um, so it's it's a touchy subject here because you know every year you know the reality is is industry and industry in St. John pays less in 2024 than it did in 2014 um, as a as a percentage to the to the tax base. Uh, and you know the only place where you can make that shift legislatively is in Fredericton. Uh, and despite having a, you know, a premier from Quispam Sis who worked for them for years, we don't seem to be able to get through. And, and, uh, the only, the only party that seems to be really willing to take a, an ax to that legislation is the greens, um, at this time. So it's, but it's a good point, right? Like we do have the ability to, to change these if we restore power to some local, right? And do you, I guess that's another question as we shift here a little bit, because I want to talk a little bit about, other parts of New Brunswick. Um, do you think we've got the right mixture between provincial power and local power? And do you think empowering local government where most people, that's what most people are familiar with on a day to day. Like I walk down the street, they can see me. They know I go to council, um, you know, and, but yet the, the limitations on local government are severe. Do you, what do you think about that mixture? between Fredericton and, their lo and our local government? Well, not only I, but the literature is pretty abundant on this point. The more you move uh, authority power programs to the local level, the more you're going to, that you are going to get accountability. I mean, mm. that's a simple fact. Uh, if you're trying to grab something that's going on, say in Ottawa, it's like grabbing smoke. Right. Uh, local government, they're, they're there, they're present, and people feel a lot closer. Mm -hmm. Second, if you look at surveys, public opinion surveys, on the level of trust that Canadians have towards their government, it's always higher with local government. Mm -hmm. Always. There, why? Well, you just made the point. You walk down the street and somebody can yell at you and say, Jesus, what the hell are you doing with this? Mm -hmm. Try doing that to the prime minister or to a federal cabinet minister. Mm -hmm. uh, or to a premier. And so, yeah, if you're asking me, should should local government have more of a say in the lives of their community? Absolutely, no question. And I would remind you again, it's not just me, the whole literature makes that point. Okay, well, that's interesting. I don't think I've heard such a like staunch point made on, on that before, because I've often felt that way, but it's been instinct, you know, an anecdote more than sort of any sort of analysis there. But so it seems to me like the remedy to, to some of the problems we've outlined here around, you know, the lack of respect for government, the lack of belief in government is in some of that decentralization of, of power and decision making. Oh, there's no question. Look, the whole problem with globalization is that people feel powerless. Hmm. There are major economic forces at play that people don't seem to have a handle on. Why? Because they don't. Globalization is a powerful force that operates above the cloud. Um, national governments um, just don't, I mean, the sort of reaction that we're seeing against government, it's not directed at local government. It's directed at national government because people feel that national governments too don't have the power to do things that need to be done. A and B, that they're not accountable. Hmm. I mean, Look at Ottawa, what it's been doing over the past three, four years. Do you think you have a say? Do you think you have that you can hold anybody accountable? Absolutely not. It's a massive 
bureaucracy where if you want to grab it, you're grabbing smoke, nothing else. Mm. Mm. That's a good point. I, uh, yeah, there's, it's a direction that we've talked about. I think we all had a little more hope for what the governance reform was going to do around, around municipal reform in New Brunswick. Um, and I can't help but think we missed the boat on some of it because, but, but I guess, I guess I'm also not as aware of the experience in, in Nova Scotia. I mean, I look at Nova Scotia with a bigger population and fewer municipal entities. And I look at New Brunswick with 90 entities and we, I know we came from 300 and some, but you know, do, have we gone far enough to empower local government to, to stand in that gap? Um, it doesn't seem like we have, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. No, we haven't. Yeah. No, no, we haven't. In Nova Scotia, uh, the advantage and the problem it has, it's called Halifax. <laughs> yeah, the tail it, that shakes the dog. Yeah. yeah, it plays both ways. There are distinct advantages of having a Halifax, but there's also problems with having a Halifax. Do you think our, we've got, you know, three serious urban centers or semi-serious urban centers and then you know we look at the north of new brunswick and i've often wondered you know what's the playbook here for miramichi and campbellton and edmonston um and what can we look to for an example to make those that part of the province um i'm not saying it's dysfunctional but it doesn't it doesn't show a lot of the the potential um, that it once did, and it continues to be something that, that frustrates um, different governments, all levels of government. I don't know. Yeah. Well, look, the original economic development problem that we had in the 1970s and 80s was Atlantic Canada versus Ontario and Quebec. Mm. That was the original development problem. That's why we had DRE. That's why we had ACOA and so on. That problem has been redefined. We don't have a problem in Moncton. Mm -hmm. Believe me, we do not. If we have a problem, it's too much growth. Right. And so the problem in the 1970s have been sort of redefined. The original development problem we have in this country is now is not urban, it's rural. Mm. We have a serious problems in rural Canada. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to get the kind of um, interest that it should. And let me explain why. We, we talked about the seven regional agencies. All mm. the head offices of those agencies are in urban areas. Not a single one of them is in, uh, is in rural Canada. The elites of this country all live in urban areas. The newspapers, the Globe and Mail, uh, the key uh, sort of opinion makers in this country are in urban areas. Um, if there's, there's, an, there's a saying that if you win Toronto and the urban areas, you win or you win the federal election. Yep. Rural Canada is a bystander standard. So northern New Brunswick is no different than northern Ontario, Cape Breton, northern Manitoba. There is a mm -hmm. rural problem in this country that we have not been that we have not paid attention to. In the case of northern New Brunswick, um, uh, its loss has been Moncton's gain. I mean, a third of northern New Brunswick has moved into Moncton. Yeah. So it's created a problem there, but it's created a problem here as well. Yeah, so it's a, it's continues to be one of those frustrating, you know, policy issues, right? You know, and uh, I want you you mentioned it's a good example of being an innocent bystander. The liberals, you know, continue to to clean up with you know some some push in from the Greens in in certain areas of the northern province, finishing close seconds and whatnot. But uh, it's uh, it's politically divided province. Um, do you have any predictions? Do you have any thoughts about the upcoming upcoming election around some of those fault lines and around some of that economic policy that we spoke about? Just as we wrap up, because I know I, I, I want to keep us to the hour that I don't want to take all your time up. I really appreciate it. Well, it's going to be a fascinating election. I um, It's clear that parts of the problems, what I fear the most is a dividing line north-south. Mm. Uh, that starts in Grand Falls and ends in Moncton. South uh, will vote one way, north of that will vote another way. That's not healthy. Mm. Um, and uh, so uh, how it's going to play out, um, can't wait to see. 
if there was one policy you could fix right now, what would it be at the provincial level? Well, I think we just talked about it. If I were, uh, and I'm not, and I would not be a good politician, I know that. <laughs> I, I don't think I could. you got elected. Um, I, I, uh, if I were Premier, I'd say we need to look at local government and repair the balance sheet. Mm. Because that's where people live. And that's where the big strain is, right? You know, it's it's where all the services are, you know, crumbling. I mean, the hospitals are provincial and schools are provincial. We know that. But uh, it took us 10 years to get a new school built in in uh, St. John. And we still haven't we still haven't gotten there. And that school is was built in the 60s. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, people see that and they feel powerless about it. So you're right. And our balance sheet continues to be better each year we've lowered the tax rate you know the populations especially in our core our, you know st john's uptown area has grown substantially um in the past five years but uh the strain around infrastructure is no joke it costs so much more per kilometer of asphalt and pipe and so, like stormwater separation when i got on council the joke was that we finally took out the last pipe that was the same age as abraham lincoln um you know, like it, it was finally taken. That's that's how behind our infrastructure is. Um, but it's not sexy to talk about, right? It's uh, it's and you know, I'm not sure we see anything on the table yet that suggests that there's any any party that's going to uh, push that. But no, I it, may think not be, it may not be sexy, but Calgary has shown that it's terribly important. <laughs> yeah. what, what I meant by balance sheet, I didn't mean revenues and expenses. I meant uh, rebalancing power. Uh, uh, I see. Yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, okay. we, need, we need to empower local communities far more. It is their future. It is their citizen. That's where they, that's where New Brunswickers, Maritimers, and Canadians live in their communities. And if we keep, if, if Canadians in their communities feel powerless, it doesn't augur well for the future of governments plural. Hmm. Well, it's a great note to end on, and you won't get any argument from this municipal councillor, that's for sure. Um, Donald, I really appreciate you. Uh, you have a staggering uh, intellect on this stuff, and I mean, I would uh, love to get you back, especially if we can uh, kind of frame it around like the post-election and and uh, maybe just get some commentary and some observation on that. And uh, But I, yeah, again, thank you so much for your time. Well, Brent, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You have a good day.